Good afternoon, everybody. I think it is afternoon, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to, um, before we start, and I want to introduce uh, Dean Pearl. Um, I wanted to mention, I wanted to thank those of you who were able to come to our uh, opera fundraiser on, on Sunday. It was really a, a wonderful affair. And uh, we raised a fair amount of money, so really thanks to everybody for you. Um, one of the good things was a number of uh, people, but a number of students said this was their first opera. And uh, one of the things we always say is that college is an opportunity to, uh, to experience things, not just go to classes, which are important, but also to experience other things. So I hope that the opera was, uh, operas are sometimes challenging, but it was an interesting, uh, and certainly was very relevant to, uh, to what we're all about. So again, thank you for that. Um, also, uh, mentioned that the uh, opera company, those of you who were there, they brought uh, seven posters of artwork uh, from Yad Vashem, which is the uh, Israeli, um, Israeli uh, equivalent of the U.S. Holocaust Museum. And uh, they said that we could keep it for two weeks, which is really nice. So they're going to be in the library. So if those of you who saw it want to see it again, or those of you who didn't get a chance to see it, come to the library sometime this week. You'll be around, you know, in the, in the first floor. You'll be there for about two weeks, and they're really uh, wonderful uh, paintings. Um, so that's a, that was a, a plus. <laughs> um, so this is the first of uh, three lunchtime lectures. Uh, next week we have uh, Manja Bach, who is Bark, <laughs> who's sitting over there, and who is a wonderful researcher, and I co-teach with her at the second half, and uh, she's um, great, and you'll really appreciate. What she has to say, she's going to be talking about the relationship between the Armenian genocide and German, Germany, right? Which is an important um, connection that we don't always uh, know about. Uh, and I know the Armenian genocide. I had the opportunity to um There's a bill in the legislature, in the Massachusetts legislature now, to mandate the teaching of Holocaust and um, genocides. And a number of people, including myself, got to testify last Monday. And uh, a number of Armenians from especially in that Mordecai area uh, were there testifying. So this will, it looks like it's going to pass, because uh, Senator Rodericks, who's from our area, is, is one of the originators in the Senate. So he's up there in the hierarchy, so I think he'll get through. And uh, that really relates. We've been, uh, on October 25th, we have a workshop um, that's going to be led by Echoes and Reflection, which is a, uh, a wonderful national group. We have someone come from Seattle, so a lot of you could attend. And uh, it's going to be for uh, regional teachers as well as our own faculty and students and community people. And with the emphasis on immigration then and now, a very relevant topic. But anyway, uh, this is kind of connected to one of our things that we are doing, uh, which is working with regional teachers uh, to do professional development. We're going to have teachers from Diamond and Berkeley and McConnelly and all. But anyway, it's very much uh, important. And it'll become more important now as this bill, once this bill gets passed. Um, the, other, uh, the other lunchtime lecture will be in November 15th in Lana Offenberg, who's from UMass Dartmouth, will be speaking there. So we'll let you know that. And I think you all got flyers on that. So we, uh, we have these three lectures, which we did two years ago. It was very successful. And we're really happy to have Dean Pearl back uh, with us for today. As you all know, she's the dean of the Division of History, Social Science, and Education. Uh, but she's also a scholar of German history. And I know she's done a lot of research over and is very um, well, uh, is an expert <laughs> in this whole area. And she's going to be talking sure. about a subject that uh, is very important, the relationship between American racism and the rise of Nazi ideology. So, Dean Pearl. Okay. So. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I'll try, I have a, vo a voice like a foghorn, so I'll try not to blow your ears out here. Um, I want to uh, make a couple of uh, remarks before I start in. And one of them is that all of my presentations here have been for the Holocaust Center. And I have a disclaimer. 
I am not German, I am not Jewish, <laughs> and I ended up in Germany studying, but quite because I'm stubborn. And I do come from three lines of really tough warriors, the Scots, the Irish, and Mi'kmaq Indians. So I got to Germany because I was supposed to study in France, and the French department at my college took my scholarship away from me to learn in France because they found out that I was taking French classes at Amherst College next door, and they didn't consider that good enough. So yes, I know, there's, there's rivalry. So uh, they took my scholarship away to study, and I said, OK, I'll fix you. I'll go to Germany, and I'll be a history major. No more French. So here I am, <laughs> many years later. And in Germany, I, 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 I finished, well, I finished my undergraduate degree in history, and I finished a master's degree in history, and I went back to Germany on a scholarship in a doctoral program, and I met a couple of social scientists who asked me, when I, when I go back to New York City, would I go into archives and do some research on German Jewish refugees, specifically doctors who'd fled the Nazis. So this is why I know about Nazis and Jews. <laughs> and I'm going to talk to you today about what that means. Um, the other thing I want to say is I really, I, I know German history, European history, world history very well. I'm not so well versed in American history. And I want to thank Professor Robin Worthington for putting me on the track to, to know what the, uh, the details of the Jim Crow laws are. So thank you so much. And the other uh, thank you I want to give to, although I don't know him, James Q. Whitman, who is a legal scholar at Yale. And he's just come out with a book, Hitler's American Model. And he looked at, he has looked at some documents that show how much interest the Nazis had in American race law when they put together laws that discriminated against Jews. So there's the connection, okay? So here I've called the lecture Racial Prophylaxis, Jim Crow Laws, 1870s to 1960s and the Nazi race laws of 1935. OK, so prophylaxis is kind of a strange term to be using here. Um, it, prophylaxis are measures that are designed to preserve health, the health of an individual, the health of society, and to prevent disease. So what kinds of diseases are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the mixing of races. That was considered a source of disease, social disease. And what have we got here? It's a picture uh, taken from a segregated waiting room in the South in the 1930s. OK. So why would the Nazis be interested in what are called the Jim Crow laws? And I'll go into what they are in a minute. Well, we could go back even to Hitler, who, while he was in prison, wrote this wonderful book that nobody reads called Mein Kampf, My, My Struggle. And he said in that book, he had great admiration, both for the way that Americans had exterminated Native Americans in the West, cleaned out the West of vermin, and he also said the United States is the one state that has made progress toward the creation of a healthy, racist society. What do you think a healthy, racist society looks like? All white. That's pretty hard to do. But he, he thought that we, this, in this country, had made a beginning. Um, and after 1933, when he seized power, the Nazis seized power in Germany in 1933, the Nazis continued to think about the United States as a good model for building a racist society. All right. So in 
So the one disappointment that the Nazis had was that while blacks were discriminated against by law and by custom, Jews were not. He was very disappointed. Jews were not included. So just to ease his soul here, if he has one, um, I have a picture here of a 1939 rally in Madison Square Garden of the German American Bund. And that was an anti-Semitic organization in the United States that had thousands of uh, followers. You can see here that this is quite a crowd filling Madison Square Garden. And the caption up on the top there reads this. Stop Jewish domination of Christian Americans. Does that ring a bell? Can you think of anything that you've heard in the last couple of years about Jews will not replace us, Charlottesville, right. So the alt-right has picked up some of these phrases from the German-American Bund. Okay, I'll be making a few more parallels. And this, by the way, is George Washington in the, in the middle there, who's the savior of white people, in case you didn't know that. Okay, so Jim Crow compared to the Jim Crow laws compared to the Nazi race laws of 1935. Basically, uh, both of them set up a situation to determine the difference between citizens and non-citizens and humans and subhumans. And you can tell that non-citizens can also be subhumans. They're deprived of their civil rights, and then they're deprived of their humanity. That's a way to prophylax system, if you want to use that as a verb. OK, so in 1934, in Germany, there's a, there's a document now that is the basis for this book. Whoops. And the document shows that in 1934, the leading lawyers and jurists in Nazi Germany sat down together and they planned the Nuremberg Laws, which was the ba were the basis for anti-Jewish legislation. And they kept really good notes, as Germans do, and they saved them. So we have that document today. And they, um, the Minister of Justice presented a memorandum on, excuse me, U.S. race law. And they big debate on how to bring Jim Crow segregation to Nazi Germany. Um, there were particularly detailed discussions of the laws in 30 of the United of the states in the United States that criminalized racially mixed marriages, criminalized them. Um, they reviewed how um, in most of the states, this, the, what were the standards by which uh, the designation as Negro or Mongol was determined? So how do, you, how do you identify a Mongol? And what is a Mongol? And so forth. So there, there, were, there, were, there were steps in American law um, that gave the Germans, the Nazis, a, a a uh, footprint for where to go. And so this person, James Whitman, and I maintain that the Nuremberg Laws reflect directly an influence of the race laws of the United States. OK. The little graphics here come from American um, signs. OK. So what was Jim Crow? Is anybody not familiar with Jim Crow? It's OK, because I wasn't all that familiar myself before um, Professor Worthington helped me out. But it, it's, Jim Crow is a racial caste system which operated not only in the South, and, and, uh, but not exclusively in the South and in border states between 1877 and the mid-1960s. And these were a series of very rigid 
laws against blacks, and a set of etiquette lessons for second class citizens. How do you behave in front of white people? Okay, and you like this sign? No dogs, Negroes, or Mexicans? Yeah. So, here are some laws. Barbers, in, in, in Georgia, there's a, there's a Jim Crow law that says no colored barber shall serve as a barber to white girls or women. Why not? They would be touching white women, right? Touching their hair. Blind wards, separate buildings for the care it, mission care instruction and support of all blind persons of the black race in Louisiana. What difference would it make in a blind ward <laughs> that you had to separate blacks and whites? What's that? Because they couldn't see color. Well, they couldn't see color, but why do you have to separate them? You're touching each, they might touch each other. Yeah, they might touch each other's faces to identify. You don't want touching. Okay. Separate burials. No colored persons can be buried in the same place that white persons are buried. This is in Georgia. And in Alabama, bus stations are segregated. Separate wa waiting rooms and ticket offices for white and colored races. Okay, so here are some segregated spaces again. You can see here, let me see if I can get, now here, right here shows the colored entrance for this establishment here. Okay. Another important way to segregate people is through education. Separate schools, separate resources, separate libraries, um, and separate teachers. And that was true in, in Florida and North Carolina and throughout parts of the South. So we'll come up to a, a question in a minute. Mental hospitals. The incarcerated patients have to be separated. Who would, you would, don't want them touching each other either, right? Very careful, very thoughtful to regulate the, the daily experiences of people who are uh, being taken care of. Okay, nurses, white female nurses can't Touch Negro men in Alabama. Prisons, white convicts separated from black convicts. Reform schools, be, care, be carefully segregating whites and blacks in Kentucky. And then, as I mentioned before, teachers. Teachers uh, cannot um, have students who are not the same race. They might touch them. Okay, finally, I thought maybe you'd like this one. There's a whole list of laws that uh, I'm not going to enumerate all of them, but wine and beer. People who are drinking can't uh, be in the same space. They have to be separated. Why? Oh, God, yes. Yes, they might drink from the same glass. They might dance. <laughs> they might kiss. They might lose control. They might decide to have sex. And that's what you want to avoid. Okay. This gets very dangerous. So those are the laws. But as Professor Worthington has shown me there is also etiquette, a guide to interacting with whites. 
All right? How, how many of you could follow this? Never assert or intimate that a white person is lying. Because white people don't lie to you, right? Yeah. OK. Don't impute dishonorable intentions to a white person, because white people are honorable, right? Never suggest that a white person is from an inferior class. You would insult their honor and their dignity. OK. Don't let them think that you know you're smarter than they are, right? Don't curse. Don't laugh at them if they trip and fall. Pretend they didn't do it. Uh, never, never comment on the appearance of a white female, because that is being too intimate, too intimate. And finally, I thought you all, coming from a state where nobody understands right of way, <laughs> and I curse every morning on my way to work when I go by the little shopping center. <laughs> White motorists have the right of way at all intersections. So who has a car? So this is against the wealthier black people in the South. All right, you following me so far? All right. So that's, th that's etiquette. But there are also structural ways in which these inequities are enforced in religion. Preachers were known to preach that whites are the chosen people. We thought Jews were the chosen people. Whites are the chosen people. And blacks are cursed, and they have to be they're cursed by God to be servants. And God is a racist and a segregationist. Who can, who can argue with God? The legal system, law enforcement, judges, juries, and jailers are all white. What does justice mean under Jim Crow? Hmm, it's, it's difficult. And then in 1891, these are just local laws, state and local laws. And then in 1891, there's a Supreme Court decision Plessy versus Ferguson, which legitimizes all of these local laws by saying it's OK to separate people if you create situations in which they are separate but equal. How many of you believe that the two groups are equal when separated? What do you think non-white waiting rooms look like? in train bus stations. I'm not going to even say train stations. Or are there even public toilets for people of color? Not necessarily. But the appearance can be so. OK? So this is a, now we have a, a, a Supreme Court that is coming down in favor of these racist laws. We have pseudoscience, that the United States is really good at uh, producing. And that we, in the 19th century, and certainly in the 20th century, eugenicists and social Darwinists. You know, eugenicists, do you want me to define that? Eugenics is the science of good breeding, which means not mixing of races. So how, how, it's, it becomes a science. It's not just a doctrine. It's undergirded with science. And you know science is always right. OK. Social Darwinists who look at the world and say, oh my god, the superior races are being outbred by the inferior races. And if we don't watch out, there, there goes the neighborhood. They're going to take over the world. And we won't be superior anymore. And there's a kind of underlying, and not even so underlying, not even so uh, subtle, a, uh, a statement that blacks are innately, intellectually, and culturally inferior to whites. And integration will cause the mongrelization of the 
white race. That's a, that's a kind of a strange word to be using. What do we associate mongrels with? Dogs, right? Animals. Yeah, not purebred. OK. And in, in addition, I mean, these are all uh, structural reinforcements of Jim Crow. In addition, we have the media and advertising that are routinely reinforcing anti-black stereotypes. Now, you might not think that this picture here is funny. This was sold in Louisiana, and people thought it was hilarious. It's an alligator eating a black child. There are ser a whole series of these postcards that were, they were pe when people would go on a trip, sometimes they would buy these and send them home. Look what I, you know, having a great time kind of thing. And the, the labeling of products. Here, picking any floor polish. Not so nice. OK, so I've, I've kept it on the, the uh, more benign uh, level right now. But th there's a violent enforcement of Jim Crow going on. Between 1882 and 1968, when lynchings sort, sort of uh, uh, disappeared, I, not completely, but dissipated anyway, there were 4,730 known lynchings. Um, and most of the victims were hanged or shot. I had a picture, I think, on the first slide of a hanging. Um, but they were also burned at the stake, castrated, beaten with clubs, and dismembered. So these are horrible deaths. These are not you know, kind deaths at all. This is not euthanasia. Um, so, and the claim is, oh, we, these are distasteful. We don't like lynchings, but they're necessary. They're necessary to keep the criminal justice system alive and to keep blacks in their place because blacks are prone to violent crimes and especially prone to raping white women. All right. You're all so, you, you all look really depressed, I hope. <laughs> yes? to the other slide. Yes. You, um, you said 4,730 known lynchings, mm -hmm. including 3,440 black men and women. Mm -hmm. Who were the 290 other? You would ask that, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I can find out because the, um, the information comes from this book. Okay. Yeah. OK. Thank you. <laughs> so. That scenario, the idea that um, uh, blacks tend to rape women, white women, is refuted way back by one of the officials at the United Nations, Gunnar Myrdal, in 1944, and who did a study and determined that most blacks were lynched for demanding civil rights and violating the Jim Crow etiquette or laws, or in the aftermath of race riots. So it, uh, th this is a kind of uh, country myth that, uh, that enforces, helps to enforce uh, violent treatment. OK. So let's switch now to Nazi Germany. This is 1935. And this is a shot of the Nazi party rally in Nuremberg. <coughs> And if any of you have seen the movie that was directed by Leni Riefenstahl called Triumph of the Will, has any, is anybody familiar with Triumph of the Will? OK, yeah. Um, the, it's a filming of the victorious German uh, Nazi party rally in 1935 in a stadium in Nuremberg. And right before this rally, there were all kinds of discriminatory signs about don't buy from Jews, don't, uh, Jews are dis disgusting, Jews are dangerous. And Hitler had them taken down for a little while because Germany was the site of the Olympics. 
and he didn't want negative publicity. Um, certainly, no Jews were allowed to compete in the Olympics on the German team, but he wanted the, to have an international impression, make an international impression that everything was right and with Germany and Germany was strong. So this is 1935, same year that the Nuremberg Laws were passed. And this is a, a copy of the laws, the laws themselves. I'll, I'll briefly, very briefly go in to um, what they were. And these are passports. Jews were um, compelled to have special passports, which they got in a special office, uh, one that, uh, that looked at your heritage. And the, all Jewish passports were stamped with the letter J, which is German for, uh, the German word is Jude, and it begins with J. So the upshot is you could be walking around, you'd have to carry your passport, and the police could come and say, show me your passport, and you'd have to show them, and you could be identified as a Jew, and then taken to, into the, the, the police station and charged with some kind of crime. It, it, it certainly happened. Okay, why did they have to put J's on people's passports? Yes? <laughs> That's right, yeah. They've infiltrated German society. And what, whereas the Jim Crow laws uh, were easily exercised, the Nuremberg laws re required some way to identify who was a Jew and who was not. So you had to have a passport. And everybody who was subject to this passport law also had to take on another name, a middle name. And all Jewish women had to have in their passport the name Sarah, Sarah. And all Jewish men, anybody know? Yeah, go ahead. Israel. Israel, yes. So that was your official designation, that was your official name. All right. So, the first set of laws sept promulgated September 15th, 1935. Take away Reich citizenship for Jews. This is the opposite of the 14th Amendment, right? Kind of. Prohibit Jews from marrying or having sexual relations with persons of German or related blood. So no mixing of the races. A criminal offense. In German, it's called racial infamy. Usually infamous things are pretty horrible, right? That's a word that we use for really uh, seriously horrible things. So who is a Jew? The Nuremberg Laws define a Jew as someone with three or four Jewish grandparents, three or four Jewish grandparents. So the implications, what if you've converted? There are lots of Jews in Germany who have been assimilated for a very long time, ones who even convert. So religion is not the basis of your Jewish identity, it's heredity. So you can never get rid of it, right? You can't get rid of your, the, your genetic connections to your ancestors. All right. Some people who were rounded up later on were, it, for their professions or their, their vocations, Roman Catholic priests and nuns and Protestant ministers because they had Jewish grandparents. Okay. So the Nazis thought that, let, let me just, Step aside for a minute. The Nazis thought that American laws about one drop of, of blood could identify someone as black. They thought that was too harsh. So they have the grandparents' laws. And I do know from 
studying in Germany, um, I knew some people whose parents were half Jewish. And when the city of Berlin, that's his two, two grandparents, when the city of Berlin was bombed, they were not officially rounded up, but they weren't allowed to go into the bomb shelters. Yeah. So you could be punished even though you technically were not a full Jew. All right. Second law, October 18th, 1935. So we're going September, October. A law for the protection of the hereditary health of the German people. So this is very interesting. It's very bureaucratic. It's very, very German. Everybody has to, who wants to get married has to go to the public health department and get a certificate of fitness to marry. Now, how do you do that? You do genealogical research. And there are archives in Germany today that are, are so complete with genealogy that the Mormons have borrowed from the Germans because they want to baptize people in um, absentia there once they're dead. So, so it, it's a very complete record of who got to be a German and who got to not be a German, who got to be a Jew. OK. And certificates were not available to people who had hereditary illnesses. You could be a German, but you could also, this goes into uh, some material that I've covered before about euthanasia. There are certain groups of people who have hereditary sicknesses who shouldn't be allowed to marry and are covered by or, or under the, the um, rules here of, of the Nuremberg Laws. OK. So in nine, November, so we go September, October, November here, 1935, another law extended the, another um, part of the law extended the rules to other groups. Uh, marriage between people who could produce race, racially suspect offspring. I don't know what that means, racially suspect. I mean, I can guess, but there must be a kind of a medical definition of, in this case, of who's racially suspect. And the Minister of the Interior declares that the relations between those people of German or related blood and Roma, Roma are gypsies, and blacks or their offspring is forbidden. Okay? Um, gypsies end up in concentration camps as well, as, as do people who aren't, who aren't racially pure. Okay. Okay, so here, here are some public documents that um, kind of Show, uh, show you what, how the, the, the laws are presented to the German people. This is a racial chart here. I can't, it says the Nuremberg Laws here. And it's not a good enough picture that I can actually read, but the white figures are Christian and the black figures are Jews. So you can figure out how much Jewish blood you have. And that might determine where, on what side of the bomb shelter you end up in World War II. And here is a newspaper, Der Stürmer, which is the official newspaper of the SS, Stormtrooper, the Stormtrooper. And it says there, death uh, sentence for racial uh, spoilers, people who defile, racial defilers. Okay, so here's a picture here of a couple of people who are racial defilers. The, the Jews are our unhappiness, our sadness. They're causing all the problems in our society. All right. So, how do you identify a Jew? Well, They'll tell you in school, you have racial uh, science that is taught to you. And here's a child um, 
who is identifying what does a Jew look like? Well, here we've got a big nose, right? And here we've got someone who I think looks kind of unhealthy, but I can't quite tell. And here's the Star of David. So how do you know, identify a Jew? And I told this uh, story before. My um, dissertation advisor in German history and in, in graduate school was a, a um, assimilated German Jew. He had blonde hair. He had blue eyes. His nose, which could, was measured also to find out whether or not you were a Jew, his nose was narrow. And one day in the room, in the classroom, the teacher, during racial hygiene lessons, asked him to stand up. And he was terrified. And she pushed him to a profile view so that the other students could see how perfect he was. His head was measured. His nose was measured. She talked about his noble features. He was blonde. He was the perfect Aryan. And the kids in the class were laughing because they knew. And so he, he stood to uh, be arrested for making the, the teacher look stupid. But what happened was that some of the kids in the class turned the teacher in for teaching false racial theory. And she disappeared. And then he disappeared, and he came to Pennsylvania and worked on a farm for a while. Yeah. So it's harder to identify Jews. Um, I'm going to say something that is probably a little uh, cheesy here, but as, did anybody else figure out another way to identify Jewish males? Circumcision. Circumcision. So in many cases, when especially as the German armies went through Poland, they asked people to drop their pants. And they rounded up those who were circumcised. All right. So that's a little hard to, hard to hide. All right. And so there's a steady process of criminalizing Jews that goes on from certainly the 1933 and even before, um, but officially criminalizing them. And this says the Jew is a bastard. And what is the lineage? This is far-fetched now. This is not racial science as even in its uh, weirdest sense, but here is an Arab, uh, an African. I think those are oh, far, uh, far East Asians. And then Hamitan. I don't remember what Hamitan means in German. So the, the Jew is, is white, but he has all of these suspect connections to other people who are people of color. Oh, oh, okay. All right, thank you. And here, further on, is a, is a law that, it, it, that um, Aryanizes, first of all, asks for boycotts of German businesses, and later on will Aryanize the German businesses and the, German, the, the, the Jewish businesses, I'm sorry, and the Jewish owners and workers are let go and the businesses are taken over by um, loyal party members. There's an interesting film. It's, it's an old film. It's black and white, and it's called The Shop on Main Street, if you ever get a chance to see it. It's about the, uh, a hapless German who comes in in Poland and tries to take an old woman's shop. And she's very wily and kind of tricks him. But here, buy only German shoes. All right, I'm going to show you this in a minute. Um, so finally, what's the connection between Jim Crow, the Nuremberg Laws of 1935, and the final solution, which was uh, cooked up in 1942 in Berlin at the Wannsee Conference. 
Um, final solution? The decision to exterminate Jews the, as, a, as an official policy. Okay. So what do they all have in common? And, and I see kind of a continuum in ways. There's no direct causation between, necessarily between Jim Crow and the Nuremberg Laws, but certainly there is a causation that is created by the Nuremberg Laws that makes the final solution of 1942 possible. And it is a process of identifying who are those enemies, either you can tell by looking at them or you can measure them and have other ways of knowing. Prophylaxis, you contain them, restrict them to certain neighborhoods, um, put them in jail, deprive them of the protections of the law. You punish them. You punish the enemy. Again. <coughs> Uh, the camps that you're familiar with, like Auschwitz, are a later development. The first concentration camps were built inside of Germany, um, in uh, southern Germany, in Dachau. And they were there to uh, contain enemies of the state, politicians, socialists, and Jews. And the final step. 1942, is the official sanction of extermination. So, so these are eyewitness accounts of two people who lived through the um, implementation of the Nuremberg Laws. The first one I'll show you is Johan, uh, Johanna Neumann, Gerechte Neumann, and she lives in Hamburg in, during the period, and she talks about her experience there. Okay, thank you so much. And you have to add your middle name to your name, a middle name. All women became Sarah, and all men became Israel. So that now my name became Johanna Jutta Sarah Gerechte. And my mother was Ali Sarah Gerechte, and my father was Siegbert Israel Gerechte. And it's interesting, only recently did I uh, realize that even people like my own son and daughter in law never heard of this uh, law that one can be forced to add a name to, uh, to their existing name. And how come the people didn't become suspicious enough to just throw everything away and leave Germany? But they didn't. I think it was a, a legitimate question on the part of my daughter-in-law. But um, they didn't. Uh, my father had maintained that he had been a uh, high officer during World War I. He had the Iron Cross. He had received in 1935 a cross from Hitler, which was given only to all frontline fighters, meaning people who for four years of the First World War spent on the front line. And how could the same men now deny them an existence or a livelihood or would throw them out? I mean, that was something that we could not do. Um, and the second one here is a discussion, a brief discussion, by a man who happened to be dating a non-Jewish woman, and he was put in a camp for it. He was, tur he was uh, turned in and put in a camp. So. Hmm? They also... At the same time, and also oh. the fact that it would not Sorry. allow a Jewish person, male or female, to go with a Gentile person, no, male no. or female. No. At that time, I was going with a nice young lady that I had gone with for some time. And we were out camping. I remember very well. I had a kayak. And 
we got out camping near Hamburg, and there was a fellow in next to us, near us, in another little camp with a tent, he slept in tents. He wanted to make a date with this young lady that I was going with, and she didn't want any part of it. He reported me to the Gestapo, and I was arrested for going with the Gentile girl. I got six months in prison, solitary confinement, in 1935. And it was a prison, whoops, yeah. They also, well, yeah. It was a prison that later became a concentration camp. He was put in Sachsenhausen, which became a camp. So, um, people have lived to tell. We don't just have documents, we have eyewitness accounts and, and people who've experienced some of the things that I was just talking about. And I want to leave you with that, that this is still living history and it affects us. We're connected. So.